All right, so obviously this is being milled on a fourth axis, which grants me the ability to tilt the workpiece. And that allows us to use better angles for ball end mills. Now, if you don't have a fourth axis, you probably need to use bull nose cutters because the center of a ball nose has zero surface speed. It's essentially not spinning in the center. So then you're just gonna rub this hard steel and then your surface finish is gonna look like absolute garbage. So that's my quick aside about tilting things. So we have our blade and if we look what I just showed you, we have these stock tabs and then we have this front stock tab. This front stock tab is used to cut, be held down with this clamp. And it's not so important in this first operation, but in the second one, it's very important because the clamp actually holds the end of the blade bevel um, in place. And then we have this like uh, boss, if you will, shape to the bevel. So it's really important here because it, it's gonna hold it and cause it not to wanna move or anything. The issue is we're going to such a thin, we're milling to such a thin bevel on the mill that you have a high probability of chipping things if there's any sort of air gap or um, like a rigidity issue. So that's why I got this crazy clamp here. Um, the more rigid you can make your setup, the better. But there is diminishing returns I have found. I used to have a tab here and you can see I was here. It was like located, it's, it's here and then it would bolted right here. I found that if for some reason the blade wasn't exactly flat and or the, the tombstone or your fixture or whatever had a it wasn't flat itself, and you go to tighten all of these bolts, the hardened steel doesn't like to bend. And I would actually crack the this tab off sometimes because there was like some sort of slope somewhere. And I'm talking like, you know, only like two thousands or something. It was enough to actually crack the tab clean off. And that also took the lock face away with, with it. So I've scrapped like three blades doing that before I figured out that's what it was doing. So just be aware that like, you can over constrain something when it's this hard. Uh, yeah, or maybe I'm just unlucky. Getting into the tool paths. First, we're going to probe height. For me, this is pretty important because we need to tell basically where we are Z wise because when I surface grind, it could be plus or minus like 1000. And you wanna have a really accurate bevel height because when we get down to, like I said, the second op over here, the bevel is so thin that if your Z is messed up, that could cause the, the end mills to start chipping the end. <clears throat> or, you know, you want to have accurate, excuse me, you want to have accurate Z heights, obviously. So the work coordinate system is actually based off this, but I'm updating it using the top surface of the blade. And that seems to work pretty good repeat repeatable wise. Uh, next, so a really important thing about, I personally think for this stuff is, <clears throat> or at least important on this knife design, is the locating features that are critical to the blade are done all in this, this current operation and nothing before, nothing before heat treat, nothing done in like the soft condition. And the reason I'm doing that is because that means the locating pictures are as accurate as essentially like the tools in the machine are without me having to like flip it over and then try to locate another feature um, and like match it to the other side. So all these features have 15 thou of stock remaining around the blade. It doesn't show it in here because I never modeled it, but there's essentially like a 15 thou um, buffer around the entire thing. And so what I do is I come in here and then I rough these these uh, the stop pin areas. And if you don't know anything about knives, the stop pin areas, like that's where the blade here, when the blade's open, it's it's resting against the stop pin. And then when it's closed, it rests against the stop pin. And these, these two relationships are really important because I'm only using one stop pin. So it needs to be really accurate. Some people use two stop pins. Uh, that way they can kind of adjust the um, where the blade unlocks where it stays open, but I found that I can get away with using one pin and it keeps the light, the knife more simple and a little bit more lightweight, but you had to be really, you really have to pay attention to these uh, locating features. So like this locating feature is actually 
important with this one because this is where the detent ball is actually going to fall into. Uh, sorry, this one. So when the knife is closed, this needs to be resting against its stop pin while the detent ball needs to be actually held in here. And if these two are off a little bit, then what you'll have is you'll have like this detent kind of lash where like you'll have play with the knife before it um, engages the detent ball. So these, this relationship is very important. Obviously the relationship between the pivot and where that is and then where the pivot is compared to the stop pins uh, dramatically changes how the knife operates. So I make sure to do all this stuff in the hardened state and that way, like I said, you're only as accurate as the machine tool is. So rough those pins out using quite a bit of step down. Almost all these tools are being air blasted except the finishing tools, except the bevel milling. And let's see, so this is a 564 cutter with a quarter inch length of cut. Not really a rigid tool I've found, so I would like to go to like a one eighth length of cut, but rough those pins, then we're gonna rough the pivot, which has been drilled previously in the uh, first operation. And there is no, there's almost no boring I try to avoid doing any sort of boring tool paths because the boring tool paths will just destroy the tips, the uh, the corners of the cutters. So it's helpful to drill when you can. And so I drilled it when it was annealed, so that makes drilling it really easy. Then we're going to rough the pivot. And then after that, we come in here with a 1 16th, really short length of cut, like a... Uh, one eighth length of cut finishing tool. So I this tool is specifically for finishing. So it is only used to finish things. So it's gonna come in here and actually finish these, these uh, slots. I found that I have to take uh, multiple step downs. So the slot itself, this vertical surface doesn't have a taper to it, but maybe using a bigger tool would help with that. But I've just found that doing multiple step downs like this is uh has been helpful then we have the actual detent and lock bar ramp slot so the detent is actually going to rest the detent ball itself rests in this little pocket against this wall so this this wall right here is crucial this this surface here but the rest of this is actually wider uh, than it needs to be there's plenty of clearance here so what I do is I come in with a two millimeter drill, drill it out, and then with a 364 cutter, come in here, air blast again, and actually adapt to clear it out. And this works really good. I'll show you the speeds and speeds for this. So basically like uh, two tenths speed per tooth, and then 100, basically 150 service feet. And then um, like a 15,000 step down seems to work really good. And I'm leaving like just um, a pound and a half of radial stock. So this is the only one boring operation I think on the entire hard milled knife. And the reason I'm doing this is there's a patch body here that goes past here. And I bore below the pocket and then I come in here and I actually contour this surface and then I contour the bottom of that pocket. And the reason I was doing this, and I don't know if it's necessary now, but uh, this is 58 thousandths is what this this, these edges are supposed to equate to essentially. So I needed this little pocket here. So I had enough like meat essentially to put a um, gauge pin in to check it. Cause you can't really check with a gauge pin against an open-ended pocket like this. Cause it's hard to tell if there's like the gauge pin wants to walk over here where there's empty material. So doing this little pocket below confirms that the gauge pin actually, that's the actual size of that that corner. Um, but I have found that 58 out, I think is too big for this design and this D10 height. So um, I've just largely been now ignoring what size it comes out to because I'm still kind of testing the, uh, the size of this pocket, but that's what that's for. <clears throat> then I just come in and finish contour the rest of the pocket with multiple step downs, same thing. Then we're going to slot the tabs, and the reason I'm slotting the tabs, and I'm not slotting them all the way, I'm leaving plenty of material, is because we want to come in here and actually chamfer the outer edges of the knife, but the tabs are in the way, you're going to blow the chamfer tool up, so I come in here and slot this with a 1 16th 
cutter. The this tool one is like my rougher essentially. So I use it for like everything. And then same thing, air blast. And this goes pretty quick actually. It's um, basically as fast as I can get it to go. So 200 surface feet, and then that's a weird whatever that number is. And then uh, step ends of like a ten or a ten valve. And then I'm leaving uh, stock on the side. Why am I doing that? Oh yeah, because we finish. We don't actually finish the outside profile until the final up. Okay, so we got then another slot and then another slot. Those are just they're just separate um, operations because I wanted different bottom heights, and that's kind of the best way to do it. It seems. All right, so before up here, two nineteen words. Supposed to be a roughing pad. Oh, here it is. So this is the lockup angle for the knife. I do it hard milled with a ball end mill. It works really good. The lockup angle is actually with the end of the lock bar, where the lock bar insert is going to rest up against as a wedge and keep the knife um, open. And then you push it over off this wedge to essentially move out of the way, and then you can close the knife blade. So this is actually a really, really important feature, and the finish you get here is really important too. So what I'm doing is I do that, I rough out the material, I remember this 15th out here. So I rough out quite a bit of material. Why does this look strange? Yeah, so rough out, and then we leave, leaving a three thou radially. Then I also cut a little bit below the surface. Because what we're going to do after is come back with a stub uh, ball nose. And I would use a 1 8, but I don't have any more tool pockets and I use the 1 16th more often, so that's my excuse. So I'm using a contour tool path because it seems to be the best for steep surfaces. So we got 200 surface feet again, so basically maxed out on all small tools. And then we're doing like a 4 tenths feet per tooth, and then a step down of one and a quarter thou. Might actually be too little of a step down for the diameter of the cutter and might be rubbing more than often, but I've found that the finish I get off here is actually really, really nice, and I get no lock stick, so that's seven and a half degrees if you're curious. Uh, yeah, so I do that. That's a pretty critical thing. And then again, like I said, all the critical features are done on the knife. Okay, so now into the actual bevel milling itself. So I'm using a, this is a, oh, what is it? Quarter inch eight flute cutter. Like it's, it's essentially like a high feed mill. Um, same thing, air. So 300 service feet to rough. And then um, 30 thou for an optimal load. And I'm only leaving four thousandths both radially and axially because what we're going to do is, I don't know if anyone cares about feet pads, but what, what I end up doing is, to, so I'm tilting the fourth axis so these surfaces become normal to the cutter, the bottom of the cutter. Not sure if that's the best way to do it, but it leaves kind of a flat sort of flat surface. Now this bevel is like a hollow grind, so you can't, it doesn't, it won't come out flat if you do this, but it comes pretty close. So I'm just matching the angle, the closest angle of what this would be. I think it's like three and a half degrees. Then same thing, I'm tilting the tool uh, to match the bevel as best as possible, just so I don't have to do multiple step downs this is what I'm trying to avoid. And then I'm leaving, uh, let's see, I'm trying not to come off the edge and go down here near the bevel, because I found on the op to flip, if you come down here and cut near the tip, there's very little material left. And when you go and service the other side, sometimes it chips the, the tip of the blade. And that's pretty frustrating because there's a lot of work to this point. So basically tilt, air blast, and rough out the bevel. And yeah, so what I was doing before was a semi finish with the same tool. And I was actually doing like a parallel Actually, yeah, parallel tool path with a pretty wide step over. But what we're going to try in this video is I'm switching to the cutter I was using for finishing. 
and we're going to use that as the semi finish. So the semi finish, this is what I'm testing. The semi finish and the uh, final finish with the with that uh, hard milling tool I showed you guys uh, is the exact same toolpath minus the step over. So for this first one, doing the upper like swedge bevel, whatever you want to call it, we're doing a, a one 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 point two thou. I don't know if you can say it like that feet per tooth, and then essentially as fast as I can get the surface footage um, for finishing, and then air blast. And uh, let's see, uh, something that's pretty important is so we're doing center boundary. You'll notice that the boundary looks a little weird just because it's tilted a little bit. But what I'm doing is I'm using a patch body that is wider than the area we want to cut. So if we come in here in this manufacturer thing, So see, so I have this patch body, and this this boundary is actually the edge of the pouch patch about wow, patch body. And then I'm using the model model um, option is checked, and I essentially told Fusion that I want to ignore the entire knife and just worry about this patch body. So that's what it's actually looking at for cutting. So that's kind of something I found that's pretty important is you don't want the cutter to actually end like on a surface, because it'll leave kind of start stop dwell marks or whatever on the end of the surface. So if you can get, if you have enough room to bring the tip of the cutter off the surface, then you can kind of negate those dwell marks. And I actually don't know if this is a wide enough body. I think it's 30 foul extra round, and the cutter we're using is a 3 16th. So it's probably not enough, but I haven't noticed any real dwell marks after doing this. So yeah, that seems to work really good. But if you're not using the patch environment to make Patch bodies for manufacturing, you were missing out on a huge part of uh, basically solving a lot of problems. So what we're doing is a 3,000 step over, and I'm trying to angle the ball at 15 degrees because I've read a couple things, like uh, studies or whatever, that say 15 foul or 15 degrees is a good angle for ball mills. That seems to be like a pretty repeatable surface finish, blah blah blah, and then like. After that, like 70 degrees was the best or something. So it's like 15, 30, 45, then 70. Whatever this one study I was reading last night was saying. So I tried a bunch of different things. And before I was actually doing it more steep, like 40 degrees. Uh, yeah, so we're going to try this. This is around 15 degrees. And then um, what else did I say about this? Oh, yeah. The... Uh, cutting feed rate and the lead in lead out feed rates are the same. That way, there's no uh, weird stuttering. You'll notice that there's a lot of point density. Uh, we're trying a lot of points as opposed to very few points. I feel like the control can keep up. Uh, yep, so there's that. Then, same thing on the bevel. Point density is pretty wild. It's actually not as crazy as it could be, but this whole path ends up being like. 1.2 megs, pretty wild. Um, it's a pretty even looking toolpath, pretty even point density until you get into the weird, like the, the grind up in the, the corner of the blade. But I don't know, the surface that comes out here is uh, always seems to be really nice. And that might be because it's kind of cupping the radius of the ball, but I don't know. So this is the semi finish and it's exactly the same parameters as the upper switch here. And same thing, a patch body that's wider than the actual thing we're trying to cut. It does, the toolpath shows it cutting the clamp, but the clamp's already been cut. So don't worry about the ball nose hitting that. Same thing, three thou. This time, or on both these semi finishes, we're leaving two thou. And the reason for that is because the other articles that I read on hard milling talk about leaving like one to 2% cutter diameter with as stock relieved. So that, I think that's what one to two percent of a three sixteenths cutter cutter is. So that's what we're trying. And yeah, basically everything else is the same. We're gonna try a pretty wide lead in lead out um, values. This is double the cutter diameter. To again try to avoid any sort of real real dwell marks. Cool stuff. Then for the finishing toolpaths, 
it's exactly the same, but this time what we're doing is um, we're doing a feed per tooth of one and a half bow because our step down, or actually our step over in this case because it's parallel, is uh, one and a half. So I'm matching the step over with the feed per tooth. And then something else I read said you want to do that because something to do with the step over and then the feed per tooth can create its own cusp pipe, but I don't really understand necessarily how or why. So I'm just doing with what I read and experimenting. So that's what we're trying. You'll notice this seems pretty pretty fast if you're not used to doing this. It is pretty fast, but it does work. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So the goal is to have a surface, a semi-finished surface that matches the final surface as best as possible because you don't want the cutter to experience any sort of load uh, that varies. So like if let's say this semi-finish was uh, like we weren't finishing all the way up against here. Well, when the actual finishing tool comes over here and goes to do that, there'll be more material, which will cause the tool to deflect or, you know, see a higher chip load. And then that'll cause like a different surface. Like it'll change the surface, obviously, because it's, um, you know, deflecting. So what I'm trying is exactly the same remaining surface to cut and uh, see if that gives me better results. So something really funny with these numbers, and I don't know if this is actually like appropriate as far as a step over goes, but one and a half thou on a 3 16th cutter comes up to three micro inches, which is three millionths of an inch cusp plate. And cusp plate is the, the uh, I think it's the peaks left over as the cutter passes by because it's a, it's a radius uh, end mill. So that's like a really small amount, three millions. Like it's very tiny. So I'm probably at machine tool and cutter limits to not actually achieve three millions of a cusp pipe. Because if there's any tool run out or the machine is not as accurate as possible or blah, 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 you know, this isn't the world's highest end machine. Uh, it's, I'm probably not achieving a three millions cusp pipe. And what's probably happening is the cutter is maybe rubbing as it's going by or whatever. So I don't actually know if this is an appropriate step over. Maybe I need to take more material off. But the last time I tried this, the finish was really nice, but you don't get like a really, really nice finish that you think you would get from three millions. I think three millions comes out to be like 400 grit sandpaper when I was looking last night. And it's definitely not uh, it doesn't look like that for sure. It looks like under the microscope, kind of a random, like jittery, nice, it's a nice surface, but it's not, it's not like what you would expect. And then it could also be like, whenever these points are commanded that maybe the tool's deflecting on like when it, you know, it, it's changing direction when it calls one of these points. So maybe there's a little bit of tool deflection and then that's causing the surface to be not as perfect as it could be. I don't really know. I'm still learning. So yeah. Then after all that really fun stuff, we do boring things and then we just chamfer and then I'm doing a trace tool path. You can use trace to chamfer because there's a chamfer option in here. So here's chamfer because the swedge or whatever is angled. So we can use trace and then we can just gently follow the surface and yeah, so let's uh, go give this a shot. All right, here's our blade. We have our two uh, kind of wide locating features that go in 3 16th dowel pins. So there's a spot here and then the other spot is here. And then you can see the pins are already here. So they just go like that. The blade literally just sits there and that's all I need to locate this thing to the fixture and yeah. In the cam thing, I forgot to mention there's one operation before the one I showed, but it's just to mill in this pocket. So I'm gonna leave a bolt out of here and then we're gonna probe this surface, mill that pocket, put a bolt back in it, and then we're gonna reprobe the surface because that's actually gonna pull the center of the blade down, which will change the Z height. So that's what you'll be seeing first, but that just takes like a couple minutes. So I'm gonna put all the bolts in here and then we'll get to breaking things. Do yourself a favor and design things with T25 bolts and not 
these stupid T15s. I thought these 832nd bolts, these, you know, the, what do you call them, panhead or whatever, had T25s because my other 832, 830, yeah, bolts have T25 heads and they're way better. Like, these are so easy to strip out. It's like super frustrating. So, yeah, just kind of see if you can design things with a bigger head. This is what I'm talking about. Same same thread, but a T25 head. Snug those up, don't need to go crazy. Okay, here's the clamp I talked about. You can see she's been through quite the rough time. Totally fine though. Oh, pro tip, if you put O-rings on your bolts, they don't fall. So you don't need to go looking for bolts every time you need them. Pro fixturing tips right there. Next time, I'm going to design this clamp as a fixed clamp, so like it doesn't have a slot in it. So that'll make it stronger and not walk on me. But I wasn't really sure how well this was going to work, so I wanted one slotted so I could move it around. But now that I know that this works, uh, I'm going to change the design at some point. So again, don't need to be crazy with the tightness, just need to be snug. I have found anyways with this, this many hold down features. We don't like crazily influence the part into the fixture, but I guess maybe you do, and that's maybe why you'd want to use a steel fixture as opposed to this. So just updated. Height. And we're going to come in here and actually rough out that pocket. All right, so we finished roughing that out. Now what I'm doing is I'm actually coming in here and scalloping the thumb slot. And there's a 4,000th material left from that adaptive. So my plan is what I was doing was coming in with the finishing tool and finishing the edge, but I found that it doesn't match perfectly because on the, the next operation or the next, like when I flip the blade, you have to match the scalloped um, smooth edges to the other side and sometimes the finished tool path like the, the shoulders didn't match so my plan is to actually cut the scallop here with material left over in the center then on the next on the next side do the same thing but then come in with the finishing tool and essentially match the inner pocket to the uh, shoulders and then there won't be any sort of weird blend marks so that's the plan but yeah, this 1 16th cutter, it seems to handle a little bit extra stock pretty well, so I'm not too worried about it. But this tool bath does take it quite a while. And I'm using coolant just to flush any chips out. And because the air nozzle doesn't exactly, uh, isn't anywhere near the tip. And I don't want to move it during tool changes because that's a pain. Because I don't want to be here for that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'll just take the extra tool wear and just live with it. Alright, so onto the op I was actually talking about in cam. Let me grab a bolt. Bolt that goes here. I don't know if you'll be able to see this on camera, but you'll notice that the blade actually moves. I wish make a real washer for that thing, but brass has been working on Put that new tool in, that hard mill tool, and we're gonna check the run out on it because I am curious. Alright, let's see. That's impressively bad. That ain't your average bad. That's like really bad. Shars strikes again. 
I'll have you know I never do this. So I was curious. Guess we'll try a different holder. Let's see if this one's any better. This is a Technic ER16 with a Technic's uh, collet. Now I'd use hydraulic stuff, but I ain't got cash. But Maritol seems to make some hydraulic stuff that seems pretty decent. Maybe it's the coating that's doing this. But I don't know if coating's that inconsistent. Huh. It must be the coating, because that is that is two thousands. Oh uh, well this the neck on this end mill is actually relieved. So maybe whoever relieved it. Hmm. Let's uh let's try to hit that relieved area. Oh, much better. Yeah, so it must be something to do with the relief on the the end mill. That's pretty wild. Anyways. I guess we'll just run with this holder since it's now installed. Let me double check out clearance for it though. Something that's pretty important to this entire operation is making sure your tool heights are correct. So we're just going to remeasure everything and get a new baseline just because we're playing with such a low stock to leave Z heights. Sweet. Alright, now we can break stuff. So first thing, we're going to probe Z height again, because I added that bolt, which changed the center height of the blade. I'm curious how much it did. 17.15 to 17.39, so that's what? 2,000? Yeah, that's quite a lot of change. So here we're roughing the two stop pin areas. Now we're roughing the pivot out. And finally doing that lock up angle thing. So this is after roughing the stop pins. Focus, you mother. Oh, you really don't want to focus here. Cool. That's that lockup angle cut for roughed in. Next up is the finishing tool bath, and you won't be able to see anything because of the coolant, so I'll probably just skip it once it starts. This is a 1 16th uh, tool that I leave essentially just for finishing. Oh, I thought I had flood on here. I guess I decided that air was better. Next we're going to drill, or pre-drill, for our slot. Here's the adaptive in that uh, weird detent pocket.
uh, slotting those tabs, which goes pretty crazy quick. Kind of weird to see. Cool, cutter survived. Next we're going to do that contour for the walk-up angle. That'll be on that back side there. begins the fun part. Man, you better focus. Just in time. It's going to do that for a little while, and then we'll start the semi-finishing. But you can see hard milling is not that hard. Well, small tools it is, but for the bigger stuff, it's pretty easy. Just go really fast. The cool thing is, the cutter's not even hot. As I gingerly touch it. <laughs> Relatively not hot. No, it's really not. Which is pretty wild to think, but. So, there is it. There's the surface roughed out. I don't know if you can see in the camera, but there are step over lines. But it's pretty cool how uh, reflective it is roughed out. It's actually much more reflective now than it will be uh, when we finish it, which is interesting. Unless this new toolpath setup actually has it to be better, but yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. So now we're going to do the semi-finish with the ball. Same thing air. This should go relatively quick with a three pal step over. So I let Fusion decide the angle for the parallel. There is a train of thought that you should just have parallel run in its normal direction of like to lock to X, because then you only have two axes of movement as opposed to having three like we have right now. And that might actually lead to a better surface finish. 
but following the curves of the surface might actually be better. So I'm not sure. I've never actually had parallel have this sort of a diagonal direction on these, so it'll be interesting to see how this turns out. Sounds like it has a pretty high load right at the beginning of the cut, so it would be better to extend that patch body, I think, a little bit off the surface, so it doesn't start on the surface like that. Well, that's definitely not good for the corner. I think it's a semi-finish. Disaster we achieved. Oh, not too bad. I mean, it has a pretty obvious pattern right here. But it's uh, very smooth. I mean, I can't feel these changes. Like I said, it's this would be six millionths scallop height, I think, if everything was correct. Tools seen better days, but I should probably change those lead-ins. But yeah. So now we're going to finish it the same exact way with a one and a half foul step over with a PVD tool and a lower stick out so it'll be a little more rigid. And I'm interested to see how that performs. Make me proud. So this is going to go, I think it's 72 inches a minute so she's pretty quick. I am speed. Now I can already see that the finish is better on this one. is done we'll take it out and look at it so last thing is just these chamfers so I'm gonna cut those we'll pull the tool and we'll look at it under the scope 
And then we'll look at the blade too. So, minus all the little debris on here, the end still looks pretty good on the cutting edges anyways. Like no obvious chipping. Yeah, it still looks uh, very sharp actually. So that's good at least. I'm not subjecting it to crazy edge breaking forces. That's cool. Here is the main bevel under the scope. So interestingly enough you can see those step over lines. What's really interesting is you come over here to the end of it and you can make out the toolpath points in certain light. Yeah, here you go. So up here in this area, he finishes even better. But the little swedge thing, the finish is not that good. And you'll notice that there's this streak here, almost like the anvil is dragging a chip along. So probably need to ch change or mess with the angle on there, but the angle on the bevel is pretty good. So here's what it looks like. See, it looked better from a distance. It's funny. It's still, it has mirror qualities to it, but you can see those, the toolpath lines I was talking about when I was going over the cam. Remember the triangle kind of comes up here. Interesting that you can see it like that. So you notice this finish in this corner is really nice. And then it's a little cloudy up in here. So I kind of wonder if I should increase the step over. I wonder if we're just rubbing material down here in the center as opposed to shearing it. And yeah, you can see that that line there. So that'd be fun to smooth out. All right, so like I said, that's the finish we got. I'm pretty sure it's the best I've gotten off the machine so far, but there's still room for improvement. In certain lights, it looks really good, and then in others, it's very noticeable. So that's the interesting things with lines at this close of a distance. Any little bit of a defect causes it to show up like really easily, which is very frustrating, but very interesting at the same time. So if you actually took this and tumbled it, it would actually highlight any of these dished out spots, which is really frustrating. So. Tumbling is not the end-all be-all, if you were wondering. So yeah, this is a good stopping point for this video. And tomorrow we'll go over like the other side, which means we can try doing some uh, different strategies on the other side. The only problem with the other side is now you have the bevel on this side, so you kind of need to be really careful about how much um, kind of cutter impact you have going on the edge because you can actually chip the edge of the knife which uh, is pretty common as far as how thin this edge gets. I have it, I think it's 5 thou on the edge is what it's cutting down to so it's it's pretty brittle at that, that thickness. Cool, uh, thanks for watching, have a nice night. Say bye to turtle. Turtle!